Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the opening evening and thank you for joining us for the first ever DSI NYC meetup. And as we all know, science has been at the forefront on human progress, pushing the boundaries of like what is possible and unlocking the secrets of the universe. But in recent years, the traditional scientific establishment has come under scrutiny um, has come under scrutiny for, incre for its increasing reliance on authoritarian on, author on centralized authority, gatekeepers, and bureaucracy. But with the rise of Web3, technologies like blockchain, smart contracts, and decentralized networks, we now have the opportunity to fundamentally transform the way science is done. Decentralized science offers a new paradigm of open, transparent, and collaborative research where anyone with an internet connection can contribute to the scientific process, regardless of their academic credentials or institutional affiliation. So just imagine a world where research is done and research data is freely available and verifiable, where scientific results can be peer reviewed and validated in real time, and where funding and rewards are distributed based on merit and contribution rather than on subjective biases and politics. This is the vision of decentralized science, and it has the potential to unleash a new era of innovation and progress. But we can't do it alone. Decentralized science requires a vibrant and diverse community of researchers, developers, and enthusiasts who are willing to challenge the status quo and embrace new ways of thinking and working. And that's why we're here today, to start a conversation, to share ideas, and to experience and to build the network of support and collaboration. And there's no better place to do this than New York City. As the global capital of culture and technology and finance, New York is the perfect launching pad for decentralized science. With its rich ecosystem of universities, research institutions, startups, and investors, New York is the ideal place to innovate and accelerate the development of a decentralized science. But it's not just about science. New York is also a vibrant and inclusive community where people of all backgrounds and experiences can come together and learn and grow and create. From the bustling streets of Manhattan to the vibrant neighborhoods of Brooklyn, New York is a melting pot of ideas and inspirations where decentralized science can thrive and flourish. So let's get started. Let's explore the potential of decentralized science and let's build a community of innovators and explorers who are, are, who are ready to take on the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. Let's make New York City the epicenter of decentralized science and let's unleash a new era of discoveries and progress. Thank you. Okay, um, so a couple of important announcements. We've already scheduled our next meetup, DSI NYC event number two, January 5th, 6 to 8 p.m., RSVP at the Luma here. Okay, next thing, um, we started a vibrant group chat there are 80 people in it so far. It has a lot of great discussions and the people you want to know. We, you can apply to be in it. If you're interested, you scan the QR code and there's a couple questions you can answer and then you get amazing opportunities inside it. And then lastly, the event today was um, sponsored by DBDAO, which is the company that I work for. Okay, now without further ado, is Ariel in here? Oh, come, introduce the mushroom guy. Here I am, all right, so up here we have Nathan. Hi, Nathan. How are you doing? How's it going? Hell yeah. It's um, great. Nathan, I'm going to read a little bit about you um, from some information I found on this thing called the internet. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> that okay? No okay. problem. Nathan's a software professional and an Adam Field naturalist specializing in fungi. Um, he created Mushroom's Observer website, which is what he's going to talk to us about, and um, in 2006. So you've been doing that a long time. Good yeah. Job. <laughs> <laughs> you've been active in the mycology community in various roles for over 40 years. Um, from 2010 to 2014, he worked for the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole where he was the director of the biodiversity informatics component of the Encyclopedia of Life, which sounds extremely fancy. So, I mean, that's amazing, good job. Um, you've also had a number of amazing 
positions according to this website, but I think we're going to talk a little bit more um, about Mushroom Observer, which is a collaborative mycology website, um, and it helps people record observations about mushrooms, helps people identify mushrooms they aren't familiar with, and expand the community around the scientific exploration of mushrooms, which I think is a very relevant topic today because I think it's something that people are super interested in. So Nathan, take it away. Great, thank you so much. So happy to be here. Let me go ahead and share my screen, make sure that this is working. Uh, Hmm. I'm not sure that's doing exactly what I want it to do. Okay. Um, just a minute. Let me, I think it, I think my machine decided to do something different than I was expecting. Let me try this. It works. Okay. Let me just try zooming this and see if that works. Yay. Okay. You just can't be zoomed originally. So whatever. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So who am I? Um, so I consider myself a lifelong naturalist. I also consider myself a mycologist. Um, mycology is the study of fungi. Um, I've been an open source developer since about 1985. Um, I've been a software team lead at various companies uh, since 94. And I was the cr original creator of the Mushroom Observer um, in uh, 2006. It was largely in response to Web 2.0. Remember that way back in the day? Um, and basically, essentially putting databases online uh, rather than just having, you know, little tiny pages that just didn't do very much. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm really interested in mushrooms. I've got a bunch of mushroom pictures. I really want to share them. I love open source. I just want to create this environment where people can go in and, and share some stuff. And I figured I'd share it with a few friends and, you know, we'd see what happened. Um, so this is the site as it looks today um, or a few days ago and uh, some example observations that have gone up here. Um, it does have a little bit of a 90s look to it. Uh, we're working on getting that updated um, and hopefully that will happen soon. Um, so, but the website, as I like to say, has been successful beyond my wildest dreams. So uh, we currently have 1.5 million images of fungi from all over the world. Uh, we have getting close to 500,000 observations that are associated with those images. And we have about 11,000 people who have contributed in some way or another um, to the website um, by uploading images or making comments or whatever. Um, so it's an active website. In the time I've been talking, I'm sure yet another observation has gone up with yet more uh, photos of mushrooms. So um, it's really, and, and it's pretty well known within the larger scientific mycology community as a source of data. And um, a lot of people use it and enjoy it and participate. And uh, we have very high level uh, top professionals that have found the community and are part of it. So why did I create it? Well, number one reason is I love mushrooms. I got into mushrooms when I was about 10. Um, my mom encouraged it. And uh, I got involved in the amateur mycology community, which is a very active community of folks that also are interested in mushrooms. Um, there are chapters in pretty much every major city uh, in the U.S. of some sort or, or some group uh, that's studying mushrooms uh, in some way. And uh, the science itself has for a very long time had a very strong and active amateur community. Um, I was really interested in sharing a bunch of images that I had and sort of keeping a journal of some way. but. I was really computer oriented. So I was like, I really want this to be online. So I made an online one, discovered Ruby on Rails. And a month later, the first version of Mushroom Observer um, was up. Um, 
the other thing that's really sustained Mo uh, is the core developer community uh, with a real shared vision. So we have a you know relatively small number of folks that are very active in helping to develop it and move it forward. And uh, it, it would not be what it is without um, that team. So um, one of the things that we do uh, in Mushroom Observer is we have a identification process. So um, I had originally been really interested in getting computers to do identification and even wrote a master's thesis on it. Um, it was a really hard problem, um, especially in the, that day and age. Um, and uh, I realized that basically I could just leverage the community that we already had um, to help with identification. So because I was, you know, just thought it was a cool idea, I went ahead and created a voting system within it so that people could propose names and then people could sort of upvote or downvote um, the name. Uh, it's essentially a seven point scale at the moment and the weight of your vote, um, everybody gets one point of vote and then you also get, um, there's sort of a logarithmic component of uh, based on your site usage. Um, so uh, you get a little, you, you get a significant boost as you start contributing. And then as you can get more and more stuff, it kind of tails off, but you know, uh, it, you continue to make progress um, in terms of the weight of your vote compared to other people. Um, the big challenge with the existing voting system is it does create confusion. Um, I won't go into the details unless someone asks me and I can explain some more about that. Um, at this point, I actually really, one of the things I want to do is change the voting, change the ID process actually, and I really want to move to more of a last one wins model, um, which is actually very characteristic of existing scientific um, herbaria and fungaria, uh, where specimens get stored, where basically the last person to really look at it and dig into it usually leaves a note saying this is probably this other name. Um, and uh, they essentially uh, end up naming uh, the particular observation or the particular specimen in that case. Um, so the community kind of likes the voting system, so I'm not quite sure how to balance all of that. This particular mushroom I chose as an image because it's our most heavily voted and contentious mushroom that's ever been on the site. Um, it has 24 proposed names. No one has agreed on what it is. We finally settled on basically it's a mushroom. That's essentially what this says. Um, and there have been 139 votes um, for those 24 proposed names. So uh, most things get a very, very much, much smaller than that. But um, there is some discussion and so forth that happens around some of the, the uh, observations. So um, one of the things that um, Michael asked me to talk about was uh, the data usage uh, of Mushroom Observer. So as I mentioned earlier, we have about half a million observations, about 1.5 million images. In the original conception of Mushroom Observer, or, or pretty early on in the conception of Mushroom Observer, I should say, um, what would that be like 2009, something like that? Um, I learned about a project called the Encyclopedia of Life and a sort of related project called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, or GBIF. And they are aggregators of taxonomy information like this, essentially observational data um, and um, other projects uh, of that sort. And so one of the things they do is they look for sites similar to this one and develop a relationship and start and hopefully get them to develop an API which we then start pushing data through. Um, and so um, Mushroom Observer has done that for many years uh, to the Encyclopedia of Life. Um, GBIF's in a slightly different state, but a lot of stuff from Mushroom Observer eventually ends up on GBIF. Um, and uh, that sort of data sharing has been going on for a long time. And a lot of the scientific community uses observations, um, particularly loaded, uploaded to GBIF, um, but, and also to a certain extent within EOL, um, there's also sort of a manual process where people have moved a lot of the images up to uh, sites like Wikipedia. Um, and some of the, or many of the mushroom images uh, in Wikipedia are originally from uh, Mushroom Observer. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, the other big interesting uh, question that 
I was hoping to encourage as I developed the site was um, species discovery. So the image over here is an example of a mushroom that uh, occurs in California. Uh, it used to go under a different name, um, but uh, one of the active members of the Mushroom Observer um, community um, was really interested in trying to publish this as a species. And he did the work um, along with his collaborator, uh, uh, I want to say it's Mark Davis. I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, she'd been more prepared on that. But anyway, um, they uh, named this Amanita Augusta um, in probably, I don't know, 2011, 2012. Um, and it's a well known, now a well known name. And uh, Mushroom Observer helped make that happen. So it's a good example of that process. There have been many others. Um, that has been named uh, out of uh, information that comes out of the site. Um, some of the things that I wasn't really thinking of that were also forms of data usage were species rediscovery. Um, so the picture over here is um, called a hypocreopsis rhododendry. Um, it had not been observed for 150 years um, in the area that this was, this observation came from, which was West Virginia. Um, and uh, this photo showed up on Mushroom Observer and people started discussing it and trying to figure out what the heck it was. And um, eventually a researcher in Scotland who was studying a related species in the UK um, picked up on it and uh, material was delivered to them. They did a DNA sequencing on it and they discovered that it was in fact the same species as had been collected 150 years earlier um and uh was a substantial um find for this species um so that was pretty cool and uh you know just this, an exciting uh, cool story that came out of mushroom observer it's not at all unusual for mushroom observer to cause range expansions um there are not a lot of active mycologists in the world that are not amateurs and there aren't a lot of systems that help get their traditions and their collections out uh, to the world. Um, and so Mushroom Reserver tries to do that and tries to help people understand the range of the organisms and so forth. And we have some maps in the website and things like that for looking at those. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, um, it's now well known that a number of species are expanding. Um, their range uh, in the world, including one of the deadliest mushrooms in the world, Amanita phylloides, um, or the death cap. Um, and it's expanding its range actively in the United States. And you can track that on Mushroom Observer. And the main researcher who did that you know, is actually on our board of directors uh, now and uh, tracks that uh, particular species and some of its close relatives. Um, one of the forms of data usage that I couldn't even envision, I couldn't envision at all when I originally created the site was that the machine learning community would get as um, excited as it is now or as, as productive as it is now and start looking for data sets similar to Mushroom Observer. We currently get a request probably about once a week for someone who's interested in using our data set in some way for doing machine learning. Um, it is actually an area of active development within Mushroom Observer itself at this point. Uh, we do have a prototype um, machine learning based identification system. Um, and uh, we hope to be able to roll out something um, in the near future that will help and assist with identification based on images. Um, there are some interesting challenges there. That's a whole other talk I could give. We'd be happy to talk more again. If you ask a question about that, I can go more into that. Um, and, and where we're going with that. So one of the things Michael suggested, I, I talk about some of the lessons that I've gotten in, in sort of building the community of you know 11,000 people that are contributing to the site. Number one, keep it simple. Um, we try to make it as simple as possible for someone to add an observation, um, get feedback, um, don't expect a lot from any one individual. Just let the whole community um, contribute. There will be people who just go gonzo and get really, really involved. And there will be people who put up one observation, get a name, and then walk away. 
Um, and that's all of that's fine. They're all legitimate contributions. Um, obviously, the people who get more involved in it presumably get more out of it. And as a result, we get more out of it, which is great. Um, I've also always been really interested in stability, focusing on community needs. Like how do we make a system that actually could live for a really long time? Um, a lot of that means keeping costs extremely low, um, just running off of volunteers, making sure that there are backups for different roles, and not like having really strict deadlines or a huge amount of pressure or anything like that. So we're all about just keeping it going. Um, I, I also think uh, we try hard to avoid required coordination. So um, somebody can go in, they can just put something in. If someone else picks up on it and sees it, that's great. If they don't, that's okay. Um, there's not a lot of coordinating within the community other than what people want to make themselves. And so the leadership of the, the project more is just doing tasks to help accelerate the, the website than trying to spend a lot of time managing the community or uh, trying to coordinate people or things like that. Um, as with everything in life, um, it always helps to be thankful and to stay humble. Um, and finally, um, there are, quote, competitors out there. There's uh, other tools that do similar things. There are even now um, or, uh, projects that have even more phone images of fungi than we do, but we collaborate with them. We work with them. Um, we are interested in the problem. We're not interested in our solution being the final solution or anything like that. We're trying to fill a gap that we perceive and create a place where people can have fun and learn. Um, and so collaboration is way more important to us than any like real feel of competition. So I love the concept of DSI. Um, I myself um, have almost got involved in a blockchain startup back in whenever that was, back, back when the um, consensus uh restriction constriction happened uh reorg whatever you want to call it um i was almost about to get hired and then uh got the rug pulled out from under me and ended up going working somewhere else which is fine um but i do like the concept of blockchain a lot um and think that it has a lot of power that we haven't yet um explored um and i love the idea of applying it to science um I'm not completely sure that taxonomy and blockchain are ready to dance. They might be. Um, I'd love to get some thoughts uh, on that. Um, I do think larger science has has like a better place to start, or maybe medical uh, research and things like that, where there's kind of more immediate energy and work. But I think there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from taxonomy and from mycology in terms of how we we go about doing what we're doing right now. And I definitely think that you know, um, that we could leverage some of those things as they come into existence, or maybe help make, help them uh, and encourage them into existence. Um, so I think of taxonomy as the original uh, decentralized science. Um, it has always been uh, a process where people working in obscure corners of the world can go ahead and publish something, um, and write down what they found and publish it in a particular way. And then that becomes uh, an, an authority on it. And they have processes for dealing with people who describe the same species, uh, but at different points in time and um, things like that in terms of what takes priority and so forth. And that's all part of the process. It's kind of messy, but it has also worked pretty well. Um, I do think there are some flaws in it that I think uh, we could address and, and get better at. Um, and I'm hoping to do some of that through Mushroom Observer. Um, but it's certainly been going on for, you know, the last 150 years uh, and doing a pretty effective job. But it is still extremely decentralized in terms of how species get named and described and discovered, um, which I think is exciting. And I think it's a, an interesting and worthy model uh, to think about um, in the context of trying to develop the ideas around uh, whatever the next wave is going to be. Um, so when thinking about blockchain and comparing it to sort of my earlier notes, these are kind of the points of conflict that I see. So 
the reality is blockchain is pretty complex. Um, I think I'm sure many people here understand it really well. Um, I myself feel like I have a decent understanding of it, um, but it's pretty darn complex. It's a really hard thing to explain to your mom. Um, and until either people have like see some more like really clear um, value in it and examples from it other than like speculating on Bitcoin, um, that's going to be a hard piece of moving this forward and getting it integrated into systems like this in an effective way. Um, I think the, the, the question still out about how sustainable um, blockchain is. Um, I do love that Ethereum has moved over to proof of stake um, rather than proof of work um, because, you know, being really interested in the natural world, it was very concerning to me how much carbon was getting generated by um, that whole process. And um, I, I think that that's uh, an important move. And I'd love to, um, I, I, I'm not incredibly close to it, so I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I would love to know more about how effective that has been in terms of reducing um, the cost of maintaining blockchains. Um, and finally, it, at some level, blockchains are coordinated. Um, I mean, yes, they're distributed, but um, there is a big component of that, which is sort of loose coordination um, through computers and through keys and things like that. Um, so to me, those are more interesting questions, like how does that fit into the philosophy that we've been taking um, with this um, uh, scientific endeavor? And finally, uh, a big question for me is, what is the value of a name? Um, Obviously, in some situations, they're extremely important, but they're also now like really, really cheap. It's really easy to make, to publish a new species. Um, and it's really easy to uh, do this. And, and the real challenge is knowing how to compare it to all of the other things and so forth. And, and there's, a, there's a big set of work that typically happens around people publishing um, new scientific name information but an individual name is it's not at all difficult to get a new name published and there are plenty of species that have not been described um like to put that in perspective the current estimate is that there's between 1.5 million and 10 million species of fungi we don't even know the order of magnitude of the number of species of fungi in the world and of those only about 70,000 have been described so there's a giant gap there. Um, there are undoubtedly fungi in New York City that have not been described. Like, there's just no question. Um, and, you know, I used to live in LA and there was a mushroom that grew a couple blocks from me that to this day has not been described. Um, so it, it's not, there's a huge gap there. There's a lot of value in filling that gap, but it's also a very slow process. And it's not something that there's a huge amount of force behind, but it's something that we need to keep moving forward with to understand the diversity of the world. And there's a lot of things um, that we just don't know um, that can probably be helpful. So plans for the Mushroom Observer. So our number one goal is to better serve um, the mycology community in general. Um, as I alluded to earlier, I've been working on um, a project for doing machine learning for ID. We have a couple of different people who are involved in that. Um, so we're looking at um, some of the current quote AI um, machine learning uh, tools, PyTorch and so forth, um, and fast AI to try to leverage that. And uh, so that's a really great project. Um, we have a small group of people who are working on that. There are other people who want to get involved in that. They're, the door is completely open and would love to get people involved. Um, we actually just released a mobile app for the website. Um, and I'll give you some of the contact information for that. Uh, it, we literally got the final version all approved and done Monday. Um, so uh, we've been have we've been in beta test for a while, and we're finally ready for public release um, of the mobile app. Um, and then the other thing um, are just sort of general technology updates. As I mentioned, the current interface uh, definitely needs a little bit of updating. 
Um, and there's a bunch of other sort of back end stuff, just keeping up with uh, the state of the world um, that are important. Um, we also have some large other projects that are out there and it's, you know, classic open source project. If you've got an itch to scratch, you're welcome to scratch it. And, you know, we're happy to talk about it and try to figure it out and try to go from there. So if you're interested in helping, um, number one thing to do, go out and find some mushrooms and take pictures of them. Um, and, uh, you know, share them back to the website and, uh, so forth. Um, if you're technically inclined, which I'm guessing many of you probably are, um, we would love help with our tech. Um, we've got a, you know, small dedicated team of folks and, uh, everyone is welcome. And, uh, yeah, just let me know. Um, and then finally, uh, we do have a donate page and we also have some exciting merch like this t-shirt that we just got available. Um, the web, the, the logo was just developed in the last year or so. Again, volunteer basis. Um, and uh, we're finally sort of stepping up and making a lot of that stuff uh, happen a little bit more robustly. So that's my quick talk. I um, wanted to thank Michael for inviting me to be here. I definitely want to thank the Mushroom Observer community. And these are some of the main names of folks that are involved. Um, Margaret McKinney was an amateur mycologist who inspired my grandmother to learn about mushrooms, who in turn passed that on to my mother, who in turn passed it on to me. And David Aurora wrote an amazing book called The Mushroom, Mushrooms Demystified, um, which is the number one source of my own original education on mushrooms and must thank them. Um, and of course, many other people have contributed along the way. Here's some QR codes for the mobile app, and I'm totally open to answering questions. Oh, there's one thing of a question. Um, I had a question right off the bat. Um, when you think sure. about like incentivizing your community, like how does that work? What what has worked well for incentivizing people? What do people respond to? Um, you know, just rip on that sort of concept. Um, honestly, the main things that people respond to is kind of attention. Like if you get in and somebody puts up an observation and you start talking about it like people respond to that and they get hooked and they do more. Um, we don't have any kind of financial incentive system uh, within it. We do have a simple point system um, that basically measures usage of the website. Um, I would like to switch that over to more of a model where it has to do with how much like buzz it generates within the site. Of course, there's a lot of issues with that. Um, the reality is that the people that really get involved, like just start doing it because they love mushrooms. Um, and that's really what we're trying to encourage. And so, uh, just building community, um, getting people, um, you know, responses, you know, we can give people, you know, rate their stuff and respond to it in various ways. And, um, you know, there are also local communities generally that they get involved in and that sort of thing. Um, but that's the main incentives um, that drive the website itself. Um, obviously, people are also interested in contributing to science in various ways. Um, but that's that's where we're at right now. Anyone else have questions? One more. I'll go. Come, come set up to the mic. There are some people screaming at it, thank you. Hey, Nathan. So just regarding that hey. decentralization part, I think it's very interesting because you guys basically operate in a very decentralized manner. Like people put content onto the site and then they vote on it. It's maybe even more decentralized than a lot of the DAOs that are in the space today. And so my question to you is how would you feel about giving ownership to those people that contribute, you know, more than points, making them like, you know, a part of the brand and that would in turn like enable the whole community to scale and, you know, more people would contribute eventually because more people that love mushroom would have access to the mushroom observer. Um, so we do, I, I mean, it is something that we already do to a certain extent in terms of just um, adding, um, uh, giving ownership. Um, definitely the way we talk about it is it's community owned. Um, it's a volunteer organization. Um, so, and we also uh, maintain copyright. Um, 
so people can point to the things that they've contributed and um, and so forth and get summaries of the work that they've done and and that sort of thing. And it is very much in the open source tradition and very much um, in terms of distributed ownership. Um, so it sort of depends on what you mean by ownership. Something else in mind, I'm really curious and would love to know um, what that is. Um, there, the reality is, so one of the conclusions I came to early on is that if the site was going to be focused primarily on mushrooms, um, there just wasn't enough money involved in that. Uh, there wasn't enough opportunity to like get big grants or things like that, that it made sense to try to charge for anything. We don't even do ads or that kind of thing. It's entirely volunteer run. It's entirely volunteer maintained. So our server, some of our server is, servers are contributed and some of our servers are, um, you know, the, the funding for the services um, that we use uh, comes entirely from the community. We just say, hey, folks, we need some money. And people are like, OK, yeah, sure, write a check. And, you know, it's I, I mean, our annual budget is about $2,000 to run the website. So that's not terribly hard to raise. I feel like we're just talking, I feel like maybe uh, you can go ahead. Um, okay, I, I just came up uh, with some idea. Maybe like every picture that observer take can be an NFT and this NFT can be pushed to the mushroom collection. So in that uh, case, the the observer actually really own the like uh, ownership of this uh, picture. And then like if uh, some people want to show their love, they can also buy the NFT from the secondary market. So uh, the observer will uh, directly gain the like uh, income from taking that picture. Does it make sense? Um, it, it makes sense. Um, again, to me, it gets kind of down to the complexity question. Um, you know, I, I, NFTs are an interesting idea. I personally like, you know, I own a small amount of, you know, Bitcoin, a little bit of Ethereum, some stuff like that. Um, I, I sort of understand how that works. And honestly, it's complicated. Um, I really don't think that the the people in the mycology community, like a lot of them are having a hard time drafting a website, to be honest. <laughs> and so getting them set up with a wallet and getting them set up with the ability to like purchase an nft and some things like that is challenging um i would love to see that become simpler but my big worry about doing that in any sort of heavy way is just the um i, I don't want to create barriers between people doing things within the system um so that's one of the reasons why we haven't explored that deeply because we're kind of sustainable as we are um I love the idea conceptually. Um, it's just a question of how to get there from a practical standpoint. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. And I also know uh, some of my friends, they're doing non-custodial wallet. Basically, you can log in the wallet without like uh, any words. You can just log in with Google account. That may be lower the, the threshold, but I totally understand. Hmm. Uh, you should make it simple. Yeah, if you want to yeah. explore this idea, like we can talk more. Thank you. Yeah, I would love to. I, I'm happy to. If we can make it really simple to do and we see some clear value, I'm all for it. Any other questions? Oh, last one. Uh, hi, hi, Nathan. Uh, thanks for, for, thanks. for the talk. So basically, um, I work in news, and the, the thing that, that's been going on is that there's a bunch of pictures on, say, Getty and Shutterstock and places where uh, a person could just take a picture of the sunrise or, uh, of the sunrise in New York and just post that, and he'll take one every day and post and upload 365 pictures to Getty and make a good living out of that. So, mm. so let's say there are people taking pictures of mushroom and sending them to, to Getty and just make money off of that. So in that case, how do you got? How do you think you could survive when everybody else is giving, basically rewards to those who are just uploading photos? And do you think decentralization is going to help with the with that? Does that make sense? Um, it does. I mean, I guess the way I would think about those, 
One of the challenges with just uploading images of mushrooms is what is the value of those in the conversation around mycology? And if you have no identification associated with that thing, and you have no um, like practical, like scientific connection for it, like you can sell it as like a front cover for a magazine or something like that. Sure, I can see, you know, getting some value out of it from that. Um, but, and you know, it's gotta be a really high quality image and there's a bunch of other constraints there and nobody really cares what species it is, to be honest. Um, and the site is more about the taxonomy and the questions about what mushroom is that. Um, and to me, that's um, a very different question than necessarily leveraging your photographic skills um, to make money. Um, I could see them meshing together in some useful way and blending, but honestly, a lot of the images that we get from an aesthetic standpoint aren't great. Um, and I don't expect that they have a huge amount of commercial value in the way that that sort of is what you're leveraging in the system that you're talking about. Um, the value is more, again, around understanding things like species distribution and uh, you know trying to understand what the diversity of the planet is and those sorts of things, which is a much harder thing for people to opt into in terms of, of paying for it. Um, and so far we've not had any like issue with, you know, the, the, the project continues to grow. So I'm not terribly concerned about, um, you know, it, it, it getting, again, this kind of gets to the collaboration versus um, uh, competition. Um, I'm not terribly concerned about a photo site, you know, making a bunch of money and photographers making a bunch of money, um, even for images that they also share on Mushroom Observer. Like, that's great, go, go team. Um, you know, and, and as I said, like our costs are quite, quite low. And so we just continue to support the community uh, in general. And, you know, it, yeah, if there was, if it was a community that had a huge amount of money, then I'd be more interested in focusing on that problem. Um, because I think, you know, I, something I'd love to work as a full-time thing on if I could, but I can't at the moment just because of the, the nature of uh, how much funding is available in the community. So that's the way I tend to look at it. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's give Nathan a round of applause. Great. Thank you, Nathan. Um, you're welcome to stick around or, um, you know. Okay, we will do. All right. You guys, you know him, you love him. He planned this event. He's the best. He's your own, uh, Michael Fisher. Woo! Um, so Michael's the founder of DB Dow. Um, previously, Michael finished his PhD at Stanford University in computer science, where he studied natural language processing and how AI can allow someone to specify a program using natural language. Um, before he was an undergrad at Stanford studying computer science, he's co-author of the book Regulating AI, who was a teaching assistant at Stanford in the Department of Computer Science and at Stanford Law School for a course taught by California Supreme Court <laughs> Justice. It's our dude. It's Michael. Yay. Thank you, guys. Okay, I'm going to pull up my slides. Thank you for the excellent introduction, and thank you also to Empire Dow for hosting us tonight. Um, they did a fantastic job and put it all put all this together. Okay, just unplug here for two seconds and pull up my slides. Do, do, do. Are you guys having a good time tonight? How many of you didn't know about DSI before you came here? Did anyone know? Is this anyone's first time learning about DSI? We're getting a little inception right now. Do, do, do. Okay, share a screen, uh, a window, this guy. All right, this will just be a short presentation. Boom. 
Okay. Um, oh wait, actually, let's this because this is a historic event and this is the first ever D site, everyone smile and we'll we'll this will we'll, 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 we'll make it into like an NFT to memorialize it. Three, two, one, say um, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And nobody said that. Okay. okay, so my name is Michael. Um, so we have, we, le we learned a little bit about the science of um, DSI. And now we want to also talk a little bit. So we're going to be hosting more of these events. And I think what we're going to do for each of them is we're going to have like a DSI project. And then we're going to have like a natural science or science project. And I hope that the goal then is if we just have like these D scientists uh, working in one room and the other one is working in the other room. Because I think what Nathan said a lot was like, you know, they only want certain things. And I think it's for, important for us to be able to understand sort of their needs and to also understand our own capabilities as Web3 engineers. So um, I'm going to talk about, oh, in the back. In, um, it's, so we're going to talk a little bit about the project I'm working on, which is trying to enable um, Web3 D scientists. So we looked at the space of compute on in Web3. And the way it worked is like we saw there was like storage on Web2, like S2. And we looked at Web3, like IPFS. And we looked at hosting. There was like Vercel, and then there's Fleek for uh, hosting. And for name services, there's uh, DNS services, and then there's ENS services. And for the server, we have our smart contracts, and we have AWS Lambdas. But I didn't really see any sort of like um, decentralized um, file or not file storage, but decentralized um, database solution like MongoDB or Postgres. And databases are so important in Web3 because without them, you can't store structured data and query it and do SQL queries and do all the things that data scientists sort of know and love. So we set out to solve this problem. So what is the, like? What are the cool things? Like we don't just want to like solve the problem with like data, with databases. We want to like expand the market on what is possible with um, when you have like a database that lives on the blockchain. So the first is like um, you can incentivize people to contribute data to your data set. So you can give them partial ownership of a database, and then they will um, they can uh, have own own some of the data or own a equity into the in the database. Um, then there's data permanence. How many times have there been in the early scientific experiments that exist where the data has been lost or the methodology, the, the, the code is lost or the papers are lost? This is a huge problem in science. And so when you have a database that's built on top of the blockchain, you have permanent data. So it'll never be, it'll be around sort of more or less forever. Um, you want to be able to link between different data sets. Right now, data is very silent. When you have a, name, a naming service that is um, flat, you can start to link things between different database data sets. Um, give people ownership of their data, privacy. You should be able to like encrypt your own data. If you want to put your health record on online, you should be able to grant people access to that base and encrypt it. Um, and then there's other things like interoperable uh, identity. You want to be able to link your data to have data provenance. You need to be able to be able to see where the data came from, who it came from, which machine it came from. And the way to do that is to tie it all to addresses. And then interoperability, it needs to just sort of work generally well with the ecosystem of data science of um, Web3. So it needs to integrate with Wallet. It needs to integrate with Lit. It needs to integrate with Avalanche. Um, thank you, Avalanche, for also helping to co-sponsor this event. <laughs> and um, so, so dbDAO is um, in a in a sentence. It's a, big, it's a database with like a DAO wrapper. So each data set is controlled by a DAO. And the DAO controls which types of data they want in the data set and which types of DAOs they want outside, they want to remove from the data set. And curation of data is really important. And then secondly, is like every row in the database is an NFT. So each person contributes a row of data to the database, and they are the owner of it, and it's interoperable with the larger um, Web3 ecosystem. So you could contribute a row to the Mushroom database. You're the owner of it, and then Someone else might want to buy, you say you're the first person to discover a mushroom. Someone else might want to buy that NFT from you and be on OpenSea. And it's just very interoperable. Um, and then lastly, is like we want to be able to, um, with this project, we want to be able to incentivize, we want to be able to share the wealth. So an individual piece of data isn't super valuable. But when you start to compose 100 or 1,000 or a million pieces of data, you get something that's where the sum is greater than the parts of the whole. So what do you do with that extra money now is you just split it up and give it to the people that help to contribute to the database. 
So the way it works is um, every row is a database. This screen is so big, it's on the floor. Okay, so um, every row is a database, and you sort of put it into this popular database. Then the database um, monetizes through, say, advertisements or through subscriptions like Spotify or through um, just people buying it. And then the money goes into the database, and then it goes out to the various holders of the database. So people are incentivized to get their data into this database, because if you get your data into the database, you can earn money. So what's going to happen then is you're going to have people that are not good people, and they're going to try and get data into the database of spam. If, you, if, if we give money out based on uh, percentage ownership of the database, if someone puts in a million rows into the database, they're going to get all the money. So how do we solve this problem? Is we force people to stake on the data. So when you contribute a row to the database, what you have to do is you have to put it along with it like 10 cents or a dollar along with that piece of data. And if your data is accepted by the DAO into the database, what happens is, is you get your dollar back. But if your, da if your data is rejected, you get slashed. So then your dollar goes into the database and funds the database. So the upshot of this is it disincentivizes people from spamming your database with bad data. It's kind of like a penny per email type system. If you had to pay a penny per email, you wouldn't get a million ads in your inbox because it doesn't make sense to do that at scale. So it introduces a little bit of friction in like a good way. So how does the, how does the administration of the database work? Um, it's done using a uh, Gnosis multisig. So from the point of view of the outside, a row comes in. And then there's a multi-sig here, which gets to contribute um, if you should accept the row into your database or if you should reject the row from your database. Now, how can that database, what are the different things that can be inside this black box of a multi-sig? It can be one person. It can be a group of people, like a company. It can be uh, a DAO itself. It could be people hired from Mechanical Turk, or it could be GPT-3. Any of these things can be curators of data. So. Uh, additionally, you might want to be able to encrypt certain columns of your database. So you would use lit protocol to encrypt different to encrypt the database. So here's sort of how it works. Uh, so you create you mint a database, then uh, you define the schema for the database, so how it will look. Um, we integrate with um, schema.org, so it's very interoperable that way. You mint the database, and then and this is written on chain, and so it pops up MetaMask here. You can see the, the transaction on chain. And now we want to add a row to the database, which is actually an NFT. So this is for an integration with a psychedelics um, uh, uh, clinical trial. So someone is describing the substance and uh, various aspects of themselves. So there's the row in the database, and, and you can add or remove it from the database. OK. And so then we want to talk about rewards. Is like we split the money that comes into the database through the various people that help to contribute. OK. That was all. Thank you, guys. Good. Anybody have any questions? OK, um, you first, and then we'll go this way. So I understand why uh, the ERC-11 box properly incentivize the But don't you run into the problem of just blockchain being really hard to like query in the first place? Like, how would someone, how would an advertiser really use like, this data easily if they want? Yeah, so we we cache all the data as well. So you can do a standard SQL or web C or web GraphQL query with it. Um, and then regarding the gas cost, because we are on Avalanche, um, the gas cost uh, together with the ERC eleven fifty five token, we actually are moving to a new thing where we're paying the cost of the gas fee because it's so minimal. And the good point about that is then um, it reduces friction a lot. So you don't have to pop up like this. What I just showed here was actually like an older version. The newer version is completely seamless to the end user, so all the gas costs are covered um, by us. And there we can cover it because it's pretty minimal. And then it's all see, it's all cached, so you can query it. And it's a drop-in replacement for an existing database. 
So you can work together with Prisma or many of the other database connectors and just drop in a URI that points to our server. And then you use it the same way you would use your existing database. But the benefit now is that the end users are owning their data. Um, uh, let's go here and then we'll go this way. Yeah, I have a question about the economics. Um, so you said that pricing or the way you would generate license that you use through like advertisements and subscriptions and things like that. But what about the key price you put in your job and each of the data? Because like technically in data business, that's one of the actually occur revenues which has been real for the licensing software in the services. Like an interesting one, but like we have recognized about and then let that person pays or has a particular year, you're going to be saving a lot of cash. So, like, man, you should Like, but I don't really see that I'm capturing value by having all the separate entities of data being in separate dams. If you're like a whole go. Oh, there's a, there's a, the, each database can have many different entities that are part of it, but one entity can be part of many databases as long as it conforms to the schema. Okay, but then that sounds like. It could be very difficult to the because although there's like an abundance of data, that doesn't necessarily equate to like set value. Like I'm just confused on how. So you can also reward people based on usage. So this is a parameter of the database. You can you can equally share equity in the database, but you can also reward people. Say one one row is queried significantly more than the other. That person should probably get more of a reward. Yeah, but they can get more reward by far. You generate more money. And that the value. Oh, well, I mean, the money, we don't control. The money is just generated based on how popular the data set is. And then whatever comes in is split between the people who are part of the database. We don't, we don't control the money coming in. That's just based on the popularity of the data. Yeah, well, uh, what I'm saying is that like, it might be a good incentive in order to have your data that you may be facing that initial fee, and then any fees that is generated from that data provided to that initial uh, contribution. But then, yeah, like, otherwise, you're not really building any equity on top of like, it. It's going to be extremely difficult right? because you're not really generating any type of value like, aside from like, like clicks or whatever. Like, like somebody has to one pay or like two, like, like there has to be some type of money involved. Like you can't. Yes, you, the, the money. Yes, I agree with that. If you understand, or yeah, I, I understand your question. Okay. So, so like, uh, basically, like DDAO itself technically doesn't have a token. The slashing and the rewards are made out in whatever the native currency is. So, you know, when they run Arbitrum, it was an ape. But now it's an avalanche. It'd be an Avax. It could also be done in theory with like stablecoin as well. So there is no dilution to a token because they're not using their own token itself. It's being gained in like real traditional revenue. It's a it's a fortunately or unfortunately. Uh, so but, yeah. that, but that's that's just maintained by the curator. You trust the curator to maintain a good data set, and if more data is uh, re creates a better data set, that's just part of it. it that's just the way that the data set works. I mean, you, you there is some dilution in like if you, the data set grows for sure. But that's just the nature of like it's like Spotify. What they do is they take all the subscriptions and then they split it based on sort of minutes listened. And there's a similar type of thing going on here. Like if your data is more popular, you get more of the percentage of the revenue. Okay. So it, like you, you, you it, I think that like there's different ways of rewarding people it's through equity, but it can also be through data usage. So if your data is more, pro if your data is, uh, you know, listen, say it's a database of music. If you have more minutes listened to, you will get more, the same amount of money that you had before. Yeah, I understand that aspect, but I was just thinking about the sustainable that. Like, there is other ways that you guys could generate the Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk more. I'm curious about you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, quick question. So, related to the Washington Observer, I guess, uh, there, was, there was one thing that they kind of mentioned. Where the, you know, the, the platform itself, revenue is generated based on donations and uh, or, you know, like merch, basically. 
But there's an interesting, you know, sort of phenomenon where it looks like, you know, once per week or however many times they've been mentioned, there are people in sort of the machine learning community that was interested in using this very large database of, you know, different species of mushrooms for whatever purpose it is. And so, you know, because there is some demand, maybe there is monetary demand or something along those lines. And so potentially there might be people paying for this. So I'm sort of curious on like if somebody were to use something like TVDAO, for instance, maybe even like the Mushroom Observer, could you maybe walk us through a potential interesting, you know, use space for utilizing the TVDAO in the instance of Mushroom Observer in that specific scenario for like yeah. how you can almost kick back the revenue generated from people using the data set uh, to the contributors of, you know, Mushroom Observer? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so the way it would work is you have a database. Um, and then instead of the database minting a row in the Postgres or Mongo, which they're using, Nathan, are you there? Yep. Yep. Are you, what, what database are you using? Uh, it's MySQL. MySQL. So they have a drop. We want to move to Postgres, but we haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> so when they, when they move to, when, whenever they have is, you know, they're sort of in the background, whenever a row is created, it mints an NFT for that person who created that row in the background. And then, Whenever there is a funding event, whether it be through a donation or through someone buying merch or just maybe an impact certificate commiserate with views that is in the form of an NFT, that person accrues points or value. And then they take that NFT and they post it on their resume or on their GitHub profile or on some other thing. And they can say, look, Mushroom Observer is a fantastic website. It has a ton of credibility within the community. And... Um, here are my six, seven NFTs, and each of them has a number of points. I'm showing it's like you know how many points you have on Stack Overflow, and I'm going to be proud of this. And um, maybe it's displayed also on the Mushroom Observer website as some things being more credible than others based on how, how much redundancy there is. And so it would, it would sort of be uh, we would look into their back end and see you know just be sort of a drop-in replacement for that. No, no, that's implemented. So the way it is, is like we connect up with uh, Gnosis Safe to uh, control the DAO. So then you put sort of any sort of governance you want on top of that multi safe So you could use boardroom.io or uh, I think it's Orca or Pop Populous or whatever it's called now. Um, and then you create a, the governance method. So maybe there's like the CEO of the data set and he has the, she has all their deputies underneath and um, you know, someone can overrule the deputies, but whatever, you know, if you come up with your own sort of governance structure that is proper for your data set and then all that just comes out is like that multi-sig has a yes or a no coming and then that accepts or rejects it. So that's just all done through Gnosis. And then Yeah, I mean, so you, 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 someone votes to delete the row, and then that goes into Gnosis, and then people deal with it there based on the governance protocol. And if it gets three or five signatures, then it sends the completed transaction to the database. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, you know, when looking at DAOs, great database, like managing those, a big part of DAOs is like the social community aspect of it. When you see like your users, like users in terms of tools besides you guys, like you know, to kind of entertain that pretty easy one. Yeah, I mean, I think that we we're very interoperable, so we can export to anything and allow for many eyes of data analysis or contribution or um, rewarding people. Um, basically, we're the database, and then other people can interoperate with that, you know, in any way they want to build interesting functionality. Maybe there'd be like a data visualization layer or something that works together with um, a Jupyter notebook or you know whatever whatever it might be and, and how people build community that way. Or maybe they display their NFTs on their um, profile on Charmverse or something like that. Like there's many different ways that we can, that we're building and interoperating with other with other communities. Yeah. Um, I'm super familiar with data, so excuse me if the question sounds bad. So let's say I upload a little data. Um, the phone number of everyone in this room, right? Um, that could be just used for basically connection, but also it could be used to scan people. So in that case, does that does that go through the notices, honestly? And if so, 
is that going to be the same as any other data set that is on Cero or different? Um, I mean, what people post on the data, like this is soft, like it does go through the notes, it goes through the multi-state. If you have someone's phone number, I would recommend encrypting that column so that it's not publicly available and then only allowing the people with the holders of a specific NFT to be able to decrypt that thing. So that's done using like lit protocol. Um, but yeah, if, if it's used for scamming, the person who's in control of the multi-sig shouldn't allow that sort of stuff to go there. So the scammer wouldn't get access to Basically, yeah, you'd have you, anything you don't want publicly available. You should it should be encrypted, and the people who should be able to decrypt it should have a, an NFT. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, well, we'll do you first, uh, and then we'll go to Karen. Yes. Yeah, so oh, okay. Right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll start in the back. We'll go to the front. Okay. Um, that will kind of follow up that related question. So I think our clinical products. I think the um, so the same thing like the identified and identified data is, is pretty interesting learning for, for this. There's a use for like the identified data sets and then typically like biomarker needs to pay more for like identifiable data. So I'm curious if you kind of see use cases like that or maybe you have a database where you have some encrypted problems, but then, you know, for like a higher fee or whatever, um, someone can buy it. Yeah. Uh, identified data with the incentive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we're doing genomic stuff now also. And so that is encrypted. And that's also stored. Like we encrypt uh, a link to an off an on an, an, uh, a separately hosted service. But in order to get access to that separately hosted service, you need to have access to the NFT that grants you the ability to encrypt that specific cell or column. Cool. Yeah. And then we'll move up. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, my, my question was I two um that was partly related to the clinical problem I was uh, interested in seeing what was like have you seen any of the flux in like decentralized for the crowd and like, want to put it on decentralized databases of that nature? And then the second one is like do you see this sort of serving as almost like an oracle or um like reading chain really data on chain and like I mean, you sort of pointed to it with like people applications and things of that nature, but just wanted to give you something. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of usage with um, decentralized science projects that are basically a bunch of people that have some question that is generally pretty well defined, which I think is a good thing. I think we see a lot of issues in science where the methodologies and the data collection become so complicated that it becomes hard to track. Um, and so they come up with a well defined question how does taking this specific drug impact my sleep? Or when I do these types of activities with food, what ha what is the result of it? Or when I um, you know, exercise and this, this, and this, and I take th this, what is the result? And so yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, and uh, that's sort of the main use case in DVD out so far. Okay. Um, I have a small question about the front. Yeah. Um, so I yeah. 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 So we cache everything. So we're just as performant as a normal XRD server on Amazon or anything like that. And then it's all sort of like the final resolution of that data is all on, can be on chain. And we are listening to all the events of any transfer between share of any between uh, token holders, and then we update the database based on that. So. From the end user's perspective, it's it's as it's within reasonable uh, order of magnitude of what you'd expect. It's just based on our bottleneck, and we could offer different services to people to make that more or less performant. There'll probably always be a free way to do it, and then maybe if you really have an application, then you can hang on. Yeah. Yeah. My question on the uh, on the uh, like the collection point is it on the database as we Bad actor versus just concrete data being entry. Yeah, so it's like a it's like think of it like peer review, like a editor of a journal. Like their job as the editor of the journal is to suss out which papers are good and which papers are bad, and which have good data and which have bad data. And sometimes they get it wrong, but the credibility of the data set is lynched on that credibility of the multi-sig or the curator of the data. 
And the curator of the data should have some domain expertise in determining correct and incorrect data. And they might have to look at data provenance. They might have to look at the lab that's doing it to make sure it's not artificial data generated by an AI that looks very practical. But so you might have to just, there, there will be some trust involved for sure. It's not a perfect process, but I think by distributing and allowing uh, a fixed uh, adjudication method for that type of thing, we have the best shot at, uh, at making it work. If someone else in the party wanted to choose that data set, they'd be reaching out to the database app and do that separate down from like time understanding how they collect the data, how they get data. Yeah. Yeah. We don't then share that view. Yeah. So there, there, is a, there is a fixed programmatic way to access the data through paying USDC, and then you get a returned data set. And then if you wanted more um, insight into the curatorial process, then that would be by asking the curators to uh, um, share with you how they determine what is legit and what is not legit. Now we do offer one thing, which is um, a data log. So you can see everything that has been submitted to the database and that has been accepted or rejected. So you wanna be able to verify that the curator of the database isn't corrupt. And they're not just slashing uh, all their enemies and accepting all their friends into the database. And so you can look at the log chain of submitted data and see like, oh, this, this, and this, this is false. Uh, I'm not gonna trust this curator. Or I want more, I want the curator to defend their actions on this specific data set, on this specific row. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, we'll go there and then. Yeah. How are you currently sourcing curators and do you plan on incentivizing curators? Or... Yeah, so the curator is generally the person that minted the database. So they have some sort of um, incentive. Like in Mushroom Explorer, it would be Nathan, who was the curator of the database, or the, the board of directors that Nathan appoints, that deputizes to be part of the curator, curatorial board. And then, yes, so these are approximate um, rewards, but like the database administrator gets 30% of the revenue that the database generates. Because the database administrator or the curator of the data set does a lot of work to make sure that the data is good. So they are rewarded. So these are approximate, but we take a cut, the database administrator takes a cut, the scout, the person who submitted the data takes a cut as well. It's just sort of dependent on the various rate, the various dynamics of the data set. Yeah. Um, is it possible, so with the data submitted, that we have, it's possible to have this big data but there, I'm sorry, I'm going about to be somebody else create the same one and another. And so then, how do you keep track? Because they're technically under the same yeah. database that you were with blockchain. Do you have a, a way to keep track of? Yeah, it's all multi chain. So wherever it is, it's we're indexed it the same way. Okay. Yeah, it's just a change in the chain ID and alchemy uh, XR or RC per PC. Any other questions? Okay, all right, last thing is, um, don't forget, January 5th, we have the next event. You can sign up here, um, apply to be part of our group chat. Here's the, here's the, here's the URL for if you're gonna take a picture. Thank you to Empire Dow for hosting. And um, that's all, thank you guys for coming. So please, everyone, mix and mingle amongst yourselves. Don't be in a rush. We're here for a while. <laughs>